for those of you who don't know me, I'm Laura Weinrib. Uh, I teach con law to labor law and American legal history. Um, and my talk today is going to straddle all of those uh, subjects. But the bulk of my comments are going to focus on uh, World War I, and uh, uh, they're going to be largely historical. Um, as some of you know, I have a book coming out this fall that argues that the modern concept of civil liberties uh, took shape between 1910 and 1940. And by the modern concept of civil liberties, I mean the understanding of civil liberties as uh, a, a set of rights enforced by the courts and asserted against the state. Um, I mean the notion that courts should ensure that state actors don't encroach on the personal rights we typically associate with the Bill of Rights and above all with the First Amendment. Now that was actually a much more complicated uh, and contested resolution than you might expect. Uh, the coalition that produced the modern uh, commitment to civil liberties and in particular to free speech was engineered by the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, over the course of the 1920s and 30s, and it involved an unlikely alliance uh, between labor radicals who were anxious to protect the right to strike uh, and conservatives who wanted to buttress the legitimacy of the uh, judiciary, uh, along with some progressives who rejected the state skepticism of radicals and conservatives, but who believed uh, that free speech could legitimate the state and could actually make it stronger rather than weaker. Okay. Um, that's uh, a, a sort of very short version of a very long story for another time, um, but it's going to serve as background for uh, what I'm going to talk about today, which is uh, an alternative path that the ACLU also uh, potentially had charted out, but which didn't take off in the way that its uh, coalition around free speech did. Now, to give you a preview of the punchline here, um, the, the ACLU worked very hard during World War I to build a movement on behalf of free speech. Uh, and though it didn't succeed right away, it got a lot of traction on that project. As I've just suggested, it managed to produce a substantial consensus about free speech by the late New Deal. But it also tried something else during World War I. Um, it tried to build consensus on behalf of liberty of conscience, too. Uh, and uh, there it uh, didn't do so well. Um, in particular, it sought to build consensus on behalf of uh, exemptions from generally applicable laws. Um, even the audiences that were most sympathetic to the ACLU when it came to its free speech project, uh, basically rejected out of hand the idea that individuals should be entitled to exemptions uh, from generally applicable laws. Now, this is, I think, an interesting uh, historical story. It tells us a lot about conceptions of rights during uh, the Progressive Era, it tells us a lot about evolving views of the courts over the next couple of decades. Uh, but it's also a story with implications today. So as a lot of you uh, know, um, there have been um, recent efforts uh, by um, a number of people to seek exemptions from uh, uh, laws uh, with respect to uh, same-sex marriage and reproductive rights. Um, and in typical historian's fashion, I'm going to leave to you to decide uh, what to make of the connections uh, between uh, the story I'm telling you today and those, uh, the resonances of those debates uh, 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 today. Um, but I think that there are some, some interesting um, uh, some interesting connections and tensions that maybe we can pursue uh, at greater length in the questions and answers. So uh, with that, let me start by giving you a sense of uh, the conformist climate of the First World War that got all of this started. So in what would become a foundational text for the modern First Amendment, freedom of speech in wartime, a law professor named Zechariah Chafee Jr. described what he called an unprecedented extension of the business of war over the whole nation. Now, on Chafee's telling, uh, the sweeping scope of the wartime propaganda campaign had transformed the United States into what he called a theater of war. Um, public officials, also ordinary Americans, denounced criticism of war as a threat to public safety. 
Um, there were thousands of prosecutions, most of them uh, very successful in front of very sympathetic uh, juries, sympathetic to the prosecution, that is. Uh, and this continued even after the war ended. And according to Chafee, uh, the new speech restrictive climate made it, uh, as he said, increasingly important to determine the, determine the true limits of freedom of expression as a matter of national policy, as well as the First Amendment. Now, uh, today, almost a century after Chafee published this piece, uh, scholars still trace the emergence of what is typically called the modern First Amendment to this wartime hysteria. Now, as I've suggested, my own view is that it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, but the important point is that during the war, almost no one thought that the First Amendment was an obstacle to prosecution of those anti-war dissenters. Uh, in fact, even the scholars and judges who were most anxious about the repression, and there were lots of those who thought that as a policy matter the repression was a bad idea, even they were hesitant to solve the problem through judicial enforcement of the First Amendment on the basis of individual rights. Um, okay, so to understand why, we have to understand what the world of civil liberties was like before the war. So as many of you know, there was no real constitutional commitment to expressive freedom before World War I. Uh, the First Amendment hadn't yet been uh, what's called incorporated into the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment um, and thereby rendered um, binding uh, against the states as well as the federal government. Even when it came to federal laws, uh, courts typically um, uh, left a lot of room for uh, Congress to regulate uh, expression. Um, it's not the case, though, that everyone thought that censorship and repression was a terrific idea. Um, on the contrary, uh, in the early 1910s, at the height of what's typically called the progressive era, many people within and outside government were arguing that tolerance was crucial to social progress. Um, that's because the progressive era was a time of rapid social and intellectual <coughs> transformation. Um, a lot of ideas that had seemed implausible a couple of decades earlier, uh, implausible also in politic, maybe sacrilegious or heretical, all of these ideas had come to seem mainstream uh, and important within a very short span of time. So progressives understood that social and scientific progress required open discussion of ideas. And yet most of them did not think that constitutionalism was the way to achieve that goal. Um, instead, they urged legislatures and executive actors not to criminalize dissent, not to prosecute dissenters, uh, sometimes to come up with legislation that would actually affirmatively protect the right to speak. Uh, but they didn't uh, advocate a litigation strategy uh, that would cabin the state in the way we typically think about it today. Um, now, the people who called themselves progressives in this period of American history uh, had a lot of con conflicting project, projects and policy commitments. Uh, they, uh, they advocated everything from uh, tenement housing laws to municipal ownership of public utilities to prohibition uh, to eugenics. Um, and lots of them disagreed over all of these substantive commitments. Uh, but there was one thing that most progressives did agree on. Um, and what they agreed on was that they distrusted the federal judiciary and that they disliked uh, a notion of individual rights that was premised on <coughs> autonomy. So to understand why, we have to move further back in time to the beginning of the so-called Lochner era. Um, many of you will know that the United States Supreme Court and its state's ca state counterparts used the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment uh, to strike down a lot of progressive legislation, including minimum wage laws, maximum hour laws, workmen's compensation laws, many of those reforms that progressives uh, had helped to push through. Um, they also, the courts that is, also issued injunctions against strike activity in cases that emphasize the property rights of employers, um, as well as the individual autonomy of workers who didn't want to be part of the union. Um, now, pro progressives, and you know, I'm going to have to sort of generalize here, again, there's lots of disagreement on these issues, but for the most part, progressives rejected all of this. So in place of the uh, autonomous individual 
what they championed was uh, the public good, uh, the common good. So Roscoe Pound, the architect of the progressive school of legal thought known as sociological jurisprudence, uh, was emblematic of this view. And Pound believed that individual, belie uh, individual beliefs uh, warranted protection only to the extent that they promoted the public welfare or the common good. Um, the problem with the Lochner era judiciary, according to Pound, uh, was that, uh, as he put it, it exaggerated private right uh, at the expense of public interest without taking social circumstances uh, into account. Pound and other progressives rejected what they call, this went by a lot of names, but among them are legal formalism, uh, laissez-faire constitutionalism, classical legal thought, basically the idea that individuals are autonomous social actors with uh, equal bargaining power. Um, and uh, you know, th this sort of language was picked up not only by progressives, but also by labor movement <laughs> themselves. Uh, even Samuel Gompers, the head of the American Federation of Labor, cited Ros Roscoe Pound for the idea that the individual rights that the courts were invoking in these anti-labor and anti-progressive cases were theoretically unsound, um, as well as socially pernicious. Okay, but um, on the other hand, most of these progressives were sympathetic to state-centered measures to increase public welfare, uh, from protective legislation to labor arbitration. Um, and in this, they differed from labor leaders like Gompers, uh, and particularly from uh, the more radical parts of those uh, labor leaders, people in organizations like the Industrial Workers of the World, who rejected uh, the state uh, entirely. And I can't go into details here, but you'll have to take my word for it uh, when I say that the labor movement was split on whether it was a good idea for the state to get involved in improving economic uh, uh, conditions and in increasing economic equality, but that uh, much of the American labor movement staunchly resisted government intervention. Okay, so all of this is bringing us to the organization that I'm going to focus on for the remainder of my talk today, an organization that uh, went by a bunch of names. Uh, uh, one of them was the American Union Against Militarism, or AUAM, uh, which would eventually become the National Civil Liberties Bureau, um, which uh, would in turn eventually reorganize as the American Civil Liberties Union, or ACLU. Um, that organization was founded by a group of progressives who were really opposed to the courts and to individual rights. Um, many of its founders, including people like Crystal Eastman, Jane Addams, Florence Kelly, Paul Kellogg, many of them had been integ integrally involved in promoting progressive legislative efforts that, in that ended up being struck down by the courts uh, as unconstitutional. Um, they were also, for the most part, really committed to labor unions and really imposed to uh, labor injunctions. So there's a big mystery uh, in the history of civil liberties, which is how it is that this group of anti-court progressives came to found the organization that is probably most closely associated uh, today with court-centered uh, constitutional litigation, or at least along with the NAACP, which we consider today uh, to be sort of the pioneer of, uh, of an approach uh, toward uh, reform that involves asking the court to invalidate legislation. Um, now, this story involves a lot of accidental connections, um, some unanticipated successes in the court uh, courts that I'm not going to tell you about today. Um, but uh, it also turns heavily on the efforts by one of the co-founders of the AU, uh, AUAM's Civil Liberties Bureau, uh, a man named Roger Baldwin. And Baldwin uh, had also begun his career as a progressive reformer, uh, but by the end of World War I, uh, he was on that radical labor side of his um, vision of what the role of the state ought to be in promoting social welfare. Uh, he actually joined the Industrial Workers of the World, the IWW, uh, at the end, uh, you know, by, by 1919, 1920, he was uh, basically announcing uh, publicly that he did not believe uh, in voting. He would never again vote or uh, perform jury service because the state was always inevitable 
inevitably the tool of capital and would, uh, would crush the efforts of the workers. Okay, so it was Roger Baldwin who took charge of the AUM, AUAM's wartime efforts to help conscientious objectors who resisted military service during World War I. So we've arrived at last at the heart of my argument today. Baldwin, along with uh, uh, the future socialist presidential candidate Norman Thomas, um, who was also very uh, involved in the early uh, ACLU, uh, was strongly committed to defending conscientious objectors during World War I. But he was particularly committed to defending those objectors who opposed the war on political grounds, on the theory that the war uh, served the interests of American industry. Now, as you might imagine, this was not a particularly popular view during World War I. Um, but what I want to emphasize is it was just as unpopular to defend the rights of radicals and anarchists to denounce the state or to encourage men to resist uh, the draft. Uh, that was also really unpopular. But as you all know, the latter, especially if you've taken uh, con law too, that latter set of claims is now at the heart of what we consider to be uh, the origins of the, the modern First Amendment. Uh, it's, at the, it's, it's at the core of our constitutional law textbooks, um, where the former is not. In fact, we almost never, in talking about the history of freedom of conscience or history of <coughs> claims for exemptions uh, from, from generally applicable laws, we almost never start with World War I. Um, so what I want us all to think about today is why uh, that is, um, and I hope that I can give you a, a little bit of context for that. So Baldwin arrived at the AUAM uh, in March 1917, um, and he, working with Thomas, his first undertaking was to secure a statutory exemption for conscientious objectors. So we're not talking about in the courts here, we're talking about getting Congress to write an exemption into the law. Um, the practice of excusing members of the historic peace churches, uh, groups like the Quakers and Mennonites from military service, was by that time pretty well established in uh, uh, American, um, uh, in, in various states and in uh, American practice. Um, generally, that was conditioned on paying a fine or finding somebody to perform substitute service. Um, uh, but uh, there was a lot of precedent for that sort of exemption. Uh, what Baldwin and Thomas wanted, of course, was much bolder. So as Thomas put it, uh, I'm quoting here, the phrase religious liberty has come to have meaning and value to man mankind. Religious objectors are therefore afforded a measure of understanding, but other rationales, including humanity, respect for personality, economic considerations of the capitalistic exploitation at the root of all wars, or a common sense observation of the, of the failure of war as an efficient means to progress, deserved, in Thomas's view, just as much consideration. Now, as I gather most of you have guessed, the Selective Service Act, as it was passed, did not uh, include exemptions for those broader uh, groups. Um, Instead, it included an exemption uh, from combatant service for clergy and for members of well-recognized religious sects opposed to participation in war. Um, the AUAM actually thought that this was worse than no exemption at all. Uh, what they said was that by conflating conscience with sectarian affiliation, con the conscription bill misunderstood the term conscience. Conscience, they said, is individual or it is nothing. Um, now, the AUAM experimented with various justifications for exemption from military service over the course of the war. Sometimes it cast liberty of conscience as an individual right, uh, and it invoked uh, what it called an Anglo-Saxon Anglo tradition for which our ancestors fought and died. Uh, it linked that commitment to the free exercise of religion, according to the dictates of uh, creed and conscience, and it ca cast that in its literature as uh, an established and cherished goal. 
Now, I should dig digress here just for a minute to say that to the, ex the, the extent to which that tradition that the, AC the AUAM was appealing uh, to was actually respected in practice is a really contentious question. So uh, certainly we know that appeals to freedom of conscience had strong colonial roots. Uh, but the general view is that the founding era judges and politicians um, did not anticipate judicial carve-outs uh, of the kind the Supreme Court created in the 20th century. On the other hand, as a matter of legislative dispensation uh, and uh, prosecutorial uh, non-enforcement, exemptions from generally applicable laws probably occurred pretty regularly. Um, in fact, uh, the principal example was exemption uh, from military uh, service. Now, for the most part, advocates of exemptions in this earlier period were concerned about a tension uh, between competing spheres of sovereignty, uh, the worldly and the spiritual, not the preservation of individual autonomy against the encroachment of state power, uh, the way that we think of it today. But by the 1910s, arguments for exemption had started to sound a lot like that sort of individual rights-based argument. Uh, and as a result, they smacked suspiciously of Lochner-era legalism to the progressives who might otherwise have been sympathetic to these claims. So most progressives believed that uh, social welfare required sacrifice in the public interest, um, and the AUAM, uh, you know, lots of language to this effect that that's what true liberty entails. AUAM had to find a way of trying to make its claim to individual conscience and exemption palatable to those uh, progressives. Okay, so in its pamphlets and publications, the AUAM tried a few approaches. Uh, it claimed that liberty of conscience was a means toward uh, social progress. It explained, uh, and I'm quoting here, that progress begins with unpopular minorities, and we endanger society when we imprison heretics and agitators. Uh, it also argued that state-enforced conformism would lead to despotism uh, and that it would encourage uncrit uncritical submission to arbitrary rule. Uh, and it argued that conscientious ob uh, objection was sort of an exercise in pluralism. It would prepare uh, citizens to uh, develop their public judgment uh, so that society as a whole would benefit because uh, of this, uh, it would teach people to tolerate diverse uh, beliefs. For a brief time, the AUAM actually uh, managed to get some traction with these arguments. Um, it uh, uh, promoted, um, so, so a lot of progressives uh, believed in promoting tolerance on the basis of cultural pluralism. Um, and so this idea that uh, this served pluralism and also <laughs> Uh, that it served state security, uh, managed to persuade people. The, the idea behind the state security argument was that uh, unwilling soldiers would uh, you know, have bad morale and would not effectively uh, fight uh, for, uh, for, for the country. Um, this worked to a certain extent even within the War Department. So I'm not going to get into uh, a, a really short, there, there's uh, a fair amount of literature on uh, what happened within the War Department with respect to administrative claims uh, for conscience. Uh, but suffice it to say that there were some sympathetic officials uh, who actually uh, went pretty far uh, for part of the war to, to expanding uh, views for, uh, pass, uh, expanding exemptions for pacifists who genuinely opposed all wars. Uh, but they never were willing to go to the extent of these political objectors who were willing to serve in some wars but not in capitalist wars. Uh, and they were never willing to uh, go so far uh, as to um, exempt uh, what were known as uh, absolutists who also refused alternative service. Uh, more to the point, they were willing to do this as a matter of administrative accommodation, but they didn't support claims uh, to achieve these exemptions through the courts. Okay, but these are, you know, these are the, the sympathetic progressives, right? To most progressives, even those sorts of arguments went too far. Uh, the, uh, the, the, they believed that these judgments uh, were properly assigned to representative government, not individual preferences or, uh, the, or to, to sort of the dictates of sectarian scruples. Um, and important progressive theorists quickly began to write articles describing conscientious objectors as antisocial. 
Uh, so the, the famous progressive theorist John Dewey uh, is probably the most uh, uh, telling example here. Uh, and he actually blamed the American legal tradition for breeding conscientious objectors. Uh, so what he uh, said was that Lochner era legalism had, quote, bred the habit of attaching feelings to fixed rules and injunctions instead of to social conditions and consequences of action, as these are revealed to the scrutiny of intelligence. Uh, and he thought a more social and less personal and evangelical method would emphasize objective facts instead of the inhibitions of inner consciousness. Uh, and you get arguments like this from another, a, a number of other notable uh, progressives. And it was opposition like that that led the AUAM uh, to modify its wartime program. So at first, uh, Roger Baldwin established within the AUAM a Bureau for Conscientious Objectors, the goal of which was to assist uh, inductees who, uh, whose anti-war commitments prevented them from registering from the, for the draft. Uh, but a lot of people within and outside the AUAM, a lot of progressives, thought that was a bad idea. And so what uh, Baldwin, along with Crystal Eastman, did to try to appease them was uh, they uh, suggested a, a, a reorganization, um, a, a new bureau for the maintenance of civil liberties, which became the Civil Liberties Bureau. Uh, of the American Union Against Militarism. And the new bureau would continue to protect conscientious objectors, but it would situate that project within a broader commitment to personal rights. Um, its mission, uh, it announced in June, was uh, not only to, 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 to provide legal advice to conscientious objectors, but also to preserve civil liberty in wartime, including and especially free speech. Now. I want to be clear here that wartime enforcement of free speech uh, was almost as tepid in practice as uh, claims for freedom of conscience. Um, but free speech clearly enjoyed uh, more support as a theoretical matter, even among advocates of the war. Uh, many progressives thought that uh, the time for democratic debate had ceased once war was declared that the world uh, would not be safe for free speech uh, until it was safe for democracy, as one erstwhile AUAM uh, supporter put it, who subsequently left the organization. Uh, but there were quite a few who disagreed with that view. There were quite a few who believed that it was important to preserve open channels uh, for communication to reach uh, what they considered to be the, the, the most democratic outcome. And these were uh, the arguments that led Zechariah Chafee uh, who I opened with to eventually endorse a strong First Amendment. So to give you a sense of the difference here, I'm going to return to Chafee's freedom of speech in wartime. As Chafee explained, the First Amendment protected two distinct kinds of interest in expressive freedom. The first was an individual interest, the need of many men to express their opinions on matters vital to them if life is to be worth living. But the second was a social interest in the attainment of truth, so that the country may not only adopt the wisest course of action, but carry it out in the wisest way. And in Chafee's view, it was that second that was much more important. Uh, and while Chafee was unusual in advocating a judicial solution, a lot of people agreed with him as a theoretical matter, uh, that there was something important about preserving uh, the channels so that for, for those inputs into the democratic process so that the outcome could be more legitimate uh, and reflect uh, better informed opinion. Um, in fact, even the New York Times during the war defended as indubitable the right of conscientious objectors to disapprove, uh, even while it uh, basically prescribed imprisonment for people who persisted in their refusal to serve in the military after they had failed Congress to, per, uh, to uh, they had failed to persuade Congress <coughs> to change the law. Okay. So I'm going to have to skip over what the Civil Liberties Bureau actually did during the war, including how uh, and why it started bringing legal cases. Um, 
Suffice it to say that its program alienated enough of the AUAM's original membership that in October 1917 it had to break off and form an independent organization called, now called the National Civil Liberties Bureau, or NCLB. Um, and the NCLB was involved in many of the famous speech cases during the war. Almost all of those were unsuccessful, but there actually were a few successful cases in state courts and at the local uh, level. Um, but when they did achieve those uh, sporadic successes, they were in the domain always of expressive freedom, not freedom of conscience. And in fact, the NCLB's binders of press clippings, uh, of press clippings basically bulge with report after report of uh, convictions for failure to register for the draft uh, and of failed constitutional challenges to the Selective Service Act. I do want to just pause here on one of the NCLB's wartime cases, which invoked that other clause of the First Amendment, not the speech clause, uh, but the free exercise clause. Uh, and in December 1917, um, the Supreme Court considered a challenge to the conscription, uh, to the to conscription, to the Selective Service Act, and the NCLB filed a brief in that case. Um, the NCLB's amicus brief uh, recognized. Uh, uh, a lot of variation in what was motivating conscientious objectors. This was much like its position that I've already explained from earlier in the war. Uh, it said some based their beliefs and conduct upon their duty towards God, others upon their duties to man. But whatever their motivations, the nation's fundamental law, including the First Amendment, extends them protection. Um, uh, and uh, basically, it went through a list of arguments uh, arguing that uh, uh, Recent decades uh, had seen a, an escape from theology uh, that had uh, rent the ties between right and wrong on the one hand and a putative maker, uh, as they put it, on the other. And the idea was that now religious w um, conscience was unbound from religion and that con the Constitution should adapt to accommodate those secular and moral claims to conscience as well. Now, NCLB's brief in the Draft Act challenge was a complete failure. Um, like the government's brief, uh, the court e essentially ignored it. Um, it, in fact, uh, it, it uh, I'm quoting here, pa we pass without anything but statement the proposition that an establishment of a religion or an interference with the free exercise thereof, repugnant to the First Amendment, resulted from the uh, exemption uh, clauses of the uh, act. Um, uh, so I, I think I missed some words there, but basically they said they, that was it, right? So they basically said, we don't have to do anything but say that this is an absurd argument. Um, and that's all we get, which goes a long way, I think, to explain why historians and constitutional scholars uh, who write about freedom of conscience or exemptions almost never talk about uh, the First World War. But the negative reception of the Draft Act challenge, uh, I think, uh, is very telling and important. So almost all of the progressive theorists who are most closely associated with the modern First Amendment distanced themselves from that case. Um, and uh, lots of NCLB supporters wrote letters urging the NCLB to drop it, to drop their participation in it. Um, even Zechariah Chafee uh, chalked this challenge up to people of extreme views, and he was extremely dismissive of the idea that there should be a carve out for conscience. Um, this was true also within the War Department. So those officials I told you about who were pretty sympathetic to some of the, uh, the, uh, the AUAM's um, conscientious objector claims were really hostile by the end of the war to demands uh, for exemptions for political uh, objectors. As one official explained in a letter uh, to the NCLB, to admit such an exemption as that for which you contend would be to admit uh, the right of every man to set himself up as judge of the wisdom of our government in engaging in the present war. It would be to acknowledge that the selective service law is binding upon the drafted man only so far as he sees fit to object to it. Um, and uh, he wrote that excusing military service on that basis uh, would open the floodgates to a broad range of other exemption claims, including tax evasion, uh, uh, respecting uh, others' uh, rights to life, exemptions from criminal law, um, and uh, uh, basically that this amounted to, quote, the negation of law of authority of government when the individual is prepared to assert that these collide with his conscience. Okay, so World War I 
taught the organization that would become the ACLU that claims for, for expressive freedom were more acceptable to progressives than claims for exemptions uh, on the basis of conscience, right? Both had yielded uh, to the war, both lost often in the context of wartime repression, <laughs> but the two types of failures were different in kind. Judges and public officials who were sympathetic to free speech rejected exemption claims uh, uh, not only as a function of wartime interest balancing, you know, not simply national security is more uh, important than this claim during the context of the war, but essentially as uh, completely incompatible with the progressive uh, worldview. Um, simply put, uh, claims for expressive freedom, even court-centered and constitutional ones, were more palatable to progressives than conscience-based carve-outs from generally applicable laws. Now, this persisted during the 1920s and 30s, even as the ACLU made headway on uh, free speech. Um, uh, I won't give you, uh, I won't go through the, the cases during the interwar period, uh, but basically there remained some people within the ACLU, uh, which was founded in 1920, uh, took over for the NCLB, right? So uh, there were some people within the ACLU who continued to promote a robust right to freedom of conscience. Roger Baldwin was one of them. In 1929, when they proposed a reorganiz uh, pr uh, uh, they proposed a clarification of the ACLU's agenda for the interwar period to have more uh, extensive involvement in freedom of conscience claims, they got a flood of letters back from these same progressive theorists, now most of whom had now joined the ACLU, saying no, do not expand into the realm of freedom uh, of conscience. Um, uh, and and uh, you know, I, this, this goes, uh, even though the ACLU filed briefs in a number of cases that we today associate with early freedom of conscience claims, probably most famously uh, Minersville School District v. Gabitis, the flag salute case uh, where Jehovah's Witnesses claimed a right uh, not to salute the flag. The ACLU was very involved in that. They filed briefs, but because of the role of uh, some within the organization, they really emphasized the free speech angle of those cases, which of course, when the Supreme Court reversed itself is how in Barnett is how uh, the Supreme Court decided the issue. Uh, they emphasized speech, not conscience. Um, now, you know, there's a story here I can't tell, which is about the fact that liberty of conscience as a, uh, as, as, as a phrase, as a sort of uh, theoretical commitment, um, was uh, picking up steam among some people during this period um, and actually did become sort of a constitutional value, although it meant something different from what the uh, NCLB had originally proposed. So even President Franklin Roosevelt considered it part of our national birthright uh, by the Second World War. Um, but as Attorney General Frank Murphy put it, um, uh, what freedom of conscience meant was that little group of Mennonites or Mormons or Quakers worshiping in their own churches in the way that their consciences tell them is right. This was not about exemptions. This was about the state not interfering with uh, sort of religious uh, exercises of, uh, of conscience in their congregations and in their personal practices. Uh, in fact, even Norman Thomas, um, uh, who had begun all of this as a Presbyterian minister who was deeply, um, uh, who was deeply committed to a, a very robust theory of individual conscience, uh, by the end of the war reframed freedom of conscience as a right to argue freely according to one's conscience. Um, all right, so wrapping up here, um, and I promised uh, I would gesture at uh, today's uh, debate. So let me say that in the universe of possible claims for exemption from neutrally applicable laws, it is difficult to imagine one less palatable than the NCLBs during the war, right? At the height of national fervor for the First World War, this uh, organization asserted a right to avoid compulsory military service on the basis of political opposition to a particular war. Um, a war declared by Congress, endorsed by popular majorities, and justified as serving democratic ends. This was the war uh, to uh, promote democracy throughout the world. Um, so in some ways, what's most surprising about the NCLB's um, uh, efforts on behalf of freedom of conscience uh, and on behalf of conscientious objectors is not that they failed to, uh, to, to get their sort of biggest and boldest demands, but that they actually got any traction uh, at all. 
Um, perhaps if they had begun with claims to free speech and gradually worked toward freedom of conscience, um, it, it might have worked differently, right? It, it might have been more appealing. Or if they had uh, made a more modest claim in an area less tied to military necessity or on behalf of more sympathetic uh, claimants, maybe they would have claimed uh, succeeded where the NCLB uh, failed. As uh, things unfolded, though, uh, you know, that wasn't how history uh, worked out. And it actually uh, took half a century uh, and massive social and cultural transformation that reshaped American attitudes toward war, civil liberties, and the state uh, before arguments of the kind that the NCLB had espoused uh, persuaded a majority of the court. So in United States v. Seeger and Welsh v. United States, as Americans again uh, were drafted into military service and deployed overseas, this time in Vietnam, uh, the Supreme Court expanded the grounds for conscientious objection to encompass ethical and moral beliefs, although they did that as a matter of statutory interpretation, uh, not constitutional law. And for a time, the court was also receptive to claims for exemption on First Amendment grounds. So uh, its 1963 decision in Sherbert v. Verner extended uh, uh, the, to the Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment the same compelling state interest requirement it had fashioned for free speech. Uh, then, nine years later, in Wisconsin v. Yoder, the court offered its most expansive reading of the Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment. But I should say, even in Yoder, it declined to extend constitutional protection of freedom of conscience to political or moral claims. Um, it clarified that a way of life, however virtuous and admirable, may not be interposed as a barrier to reasonable state regulation if it is based on purely secular uh, considerations. Still, this was a very, this case very expansively protected uh, freedom of conscience. That said, you know, despite this very lofty constitutional language in Yoder, constitutional claims for exemptions rarely succeeded in practice. So uh, the few successful cases generally involved denial of unemployment benefits uh, under similar uh, circumstances very similar to the, to the Sherbert case. Um, and Yoder, of course, involved a state's effort to control childhood education, which was something that the ACLU had been really active in during the 1920s and 30s because it Seemed to involved, uh, it seemed to involve the same sorts of values as free speech did, as a way of promoting pluralism and uh, forming a more robust and better informed electorate. OK. Um, sort of fast forwarding, um, we get to uh, uh, 1990, when the court officially abandoned the so-called Sherbert Yoder test. Um, and in his majority opinion in Employment Division v. Smith, uh, the late Justice Scalia explicitly repudiated the analogy with expressive freedom that purportedly had justified uh, strict scrutiny in the context of religious exemptions. Um, what he said was that the two contexts were not remotely comparable, um, and to recognize a private right to ignore generally applicable laws would create a constitutional anomaly. Um, I see I'm, I'm running over time. So let me just very, very quickly uh, wrap up here. Um, Despite all this, by the time that uh, the, by the time that Smith was decided, there was a lot of demand for a more robust vision of uh, exemption from generally applicable laws. Um, that led to uh, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which was passed with tremendous bipartisan support. And the ACLU testified in Congress on behalf of RIFRA. Um, it considered it one of its crowning achievements. Uh, Bill Clinton signed it and said, uh, uh, there's a you know, you know, voicing wonder at the unusual alliance of forces that are often at odds across religious or ideological lines. Um, but this sort of euphoric moment of consensus about religious exemption, as most of you know, was short-lived. Um, at the end of the 20th century, the changing nature of demands for exemptions under RIFRA and its state counterparts began to trouble the ACLU. Um, and uh, an escalation in the rhetoric of religious freedom and liberty of conscience um, corresponded with a proliferation of claims related to same-sex marriage and reproductive rights, which led the ACLU to complain uh, that RIFRA was, RIFRA was being used as a sword to discriminate against women, gay, and transgender people, and others. Um, 
Okay, so, so and I'll, just to, to, to bring you up to speed, the ACLU has recently criticized the newest set of challenges to the ACA's contraception mandate for endeavoring to deprive women of a benefit guaranteed by the law. Um, uh, and uh, has basically distanced itself from this law, which it helped uh, to pass. Now, the NCLB obviously could not have anticipated uh, the world of RIFRA, the Affordable Care Act, uh, and uh, other cases. It would not have worried, as the ACLU uh, does today, that exemptions from generally applicable laws might be made to uh, force employees to pay a price for their employer's faith. Um, and that's because at the height of the Lochner era, employers' constitutional and common law property rights ensured that employers could hire, fire, uh, and allocate or deny benefits with almost perfect uh, impunity. So liberty of contract was constitutionally secure. There was little reason to worry that businesses would discriminate on the basis of religious freedom instead. Still, um, even within the ACLU, those progressives who had confronted the costs of uh, counter-majoritarian constitutionalism head on really distrusted uh, the uh, extension of individual rights. So let me wrap up by, with what is, I think, a, a sort of telling uh, uh, pairing, uh, which was in the trial of Roger Baldwin himself for um, failure to register for the draft. Um, and as it turned out, the person who sentenced him was a judge named Julius, Julius M. Mayer, who in 1905, as Attorney General of New York, had unsuccessfully defended the maximum hours law at issue in Lochner v. New York. Um, and by happenstance, it was Mayer who sentenced Roger Baldwin to jail uh, for failure to register. Um, so to Mayor, Baldwin's refusal to submit to state power, uh, as he put it, threatened the very basis of democratic government. Uh, he said, I think such an attitude would have led inevitably to disorder and finally to the destruction of a government which with all of the imperfections that may attach to human government has proved itself, as I view it, to be a real people's government. He said the success of American democracy was evidenced by the millions upon millions of men who voluntarily obey the laws, and some of them requiring great sacrifice, which, as enacted by the legislator, embody the judgment of the people at large. Um, so I guess I'll leave off there. I don't want to suggest that there's a neat answer to this problem. What I want you all to take away from this is the fact that these tensions are deeply embedded in the history both of free speech and of, uh, uh, of, of freedom of conscience um, as the way that they've unfolded. Um, and uh, you know, I think it's worth pausing to think about uh, whether the limitations uh, that sort of were written into the way that uh, civil liberties developed in American history still have uh, resonance and purchase when we return um, to these issues today. So I think, does anyone know, when, um, when does this, 115. Okay, so uh, I'd, I'd love to take a few questions. Yeah. Right. So, um, you know, obviously this is uh, a, a central question and a really important one, right? So, uh, it, it, you know, for people who um, are, are inclined to sort of dismiss this history of the ACLU's unsuccessful uh, effort to expand exemptions, um, uh, you know, the obvious response is, well, of course, but they were pushing for secular exemptions that were not deeply religious rooted. Now, as uh, you know, as many of you are probably unaware, uh, uh, aware that sort of religious kernel has sort of unraveled also in the contemporary space involving exemptions. So that uh, recently, a lot of people have been asserting secular exemptions um, from these sorts of laws. There was actually a, a district court opinion uh, that, uh, in fact, upheld a uh, that uh, credited a um, secular. 
uh, uh, organizations' opposition to distributing um, contraception on the basis of, uh, of freedom of conscience, essentially, uh, um, uh, the free exercise clause, even though it wasn't uh, uh, religiously rooted. So there's a real question. This is a live question of what's going to happen in that direction. And in fact, actually, in the, in the briefing in the case for Friedrichs v. California Teachers Association, not in the briefing, in some of the public comments, uh, there have been a lot of claims about how what this, what the, what the um, uh, law at stake in that case does is it uh, uh, infringes on the freedom of conscience of uh, workers um, who uh, don't want to join the union. So this language has sort of been imported into other contexts, even if not strictly constitutionally. But clearly, there's uh, there's a distance between these two. Um, and I guess for the purposes of my talk. Um, what I want to emphasize, what, you know, the, 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 the key part is that both of those seemed implausible to the people who were promoting uh, religious exemption claims uh, during the First World War, right? So courts were also, certainly the Supreme Court of the United States, with respect um, to state and also federal laws, was not um, recognizing broader religiously based exemptions either, um, in the same way that, you know, speech was sort of closely cabined during this period. So what I'm trying to sort of recover here is this world of possibility. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, both uh, were, I guess, in some sense, formally within that space. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, oh, you know, only one made it. But, you know, obviously, there's a strong textual hook that's really, you know, hard to ignore in the context of uh, free exercise of, 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 of religion that, that made that claim more, more implausible than, than its alternative. Yeah. Uh, there's been some debates about the fact that court hasn't really defined what religion is, and in an attempt to do that, either over-inclusive or under-inclusive, how important do you think it is um, in the area of pluralism and spiritualism and various ways of people interpreting what's religious uh, for the court to have some test or some clear way of knowing when they're actually dealing with religion? Well, right. So, um, you know, obviously, and this is, this is a great follow up because this is another uh, area of trouble, right? So, and this is what ended up happening in the Vietnam era cases too. Basically, the court has to give a lot of deference to somebody's claim that their belief is in fact religious, right? The court does not want to be in the business of determining whether something is a genuinely held religious belief. We've seen that uh, across a range of areas, uh, both legislative and in the domain of constitutional interpretation. Basically, the court wants uh, to defer. Now, uh, there are some people for whom it's important that they uh, Distinct, you know, that they establish their claims as non-religious. And those are the people who are going to be losers in a world in which articulating a religious rationale uh, is, uh, is crucial. Um, but, uh, but for you know, the vast universe of people who are more probably more interested in, in winning their claim than in offering a rationale for why, um, uh, you know, the court has been pretty clear about the fact that as long as you can sort of make a plausible track record for why uh, this is a religious view, uh, it's going to be deferential. Uh, it's going to be deferential. And I don't think the court could do anything else, right? I think it would be a real problem for the court to be getting in the business of determining whether people's religious views are genuinely held or not, or whether uh, uh, they are sufficiently established to count as religion in some, uh, in some uh, sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that play any role in the story that you told? And going forward, do you think it'll play any role in these debates over um, you know, exemptions from generally applicable law, especially with respect to LGBT groups? Um, so I, the short answer is yes. It played a tremendous role, but I'm wondering if you have a uh, sort of more specific. There's a lot I could do with. So. so um, Look, there's, there's a big literature on whether that distinction actually makes sense, right? The distinction between positive and negative rights. Um, I will say that from the perspective of people who were engaged in it, uh, it was a uh, distinction with traction. And so the idea was that positive rights were rights that were granted by the government. Socioeconomic rights were typically put in that uh, bundle, uh, whereas negative rights were rights asserted against 
the, the government as uh, the actor. Now, I should say all of these people were sophisticated and understood that state action operated in lots of different ways, including in the enforcement of common law. Uh, rights through the courts. But still, they understood something, uh, uh, you know, they, they had some view of a sort of underlying arrangement uh, that of, of, um, of interactions that were outside of, of the domain of typical state action. Um, so the ACLU uh, fought against uh, New Deal progressives who wanted a much more uh, robust uh, sort of uh, positive rights theory of civil liberties during the 1930s, um, and who wanted to do that by actually, um, uh, you know, making a sort of constitutional claim for uh, socioeconomic equality. Um, and the ACLU, because of that skepticism I told you about that stemmed from its connections with the industrial workers of the world, really distrusted the state. Uh, and as a result, um, really pushed uh, toward a more negative rights view, which is the one I think we're left with uh, today. Um, it's not so much core. I mean, that's certainly a part of the story about uh, exemptions as well, although I think it actually plays more into the story about uh, labor and workers' rights, which I've sort of left to the side for the purposes of this talk. Yeah. Um, to what extent uh, do these debates have resonances in the international arena, whether it be uh, at the drafting of the Oracle Declaration of Human Rights and subsequent prominence in the United Nations or the whole thinking process, or is it fair to say that sort of the expressive rights guaranteed by the um, American law Um, so uh, it's a great question. Um, you know, it's not something. Uh, is Lyle here? I thought I saw him before. No. So uh, it's, it's it's a, a, a question that, in fact, um, uh, one of our students is working on right now, and is I think a really rich one. Um, uh, what um, he's he's showing is that uh, a lot of legal actors. Um, who were involved in articulating these rights and sort of in that conservative radical coalition that I told you about before were the same people who were importing that uh, onto the uh, international stage and were very active in uh, drafting uh, the Universal Declaration. Um, but uh, you know, I would say uh, a lot of it did originate um, with. So, you know, Roger Baldwin, for example, was extremely. Uh, active uh, in, uh, in promoting international human rights separately from the ACLU uh, and was very influential uh, in that um, in that movement, um, but uh, you know they were pretty disentangled. At, at least in the 1920s, they kept those spheres and, and 30s. They kept those spheres pretty distinct. Well, so this is the crazy thing, right? I mean, you have to remember that Baldwin wanted to dismantle the state, right? So, I mean, you know, the idea that it would lead to a problem with uh, exemptions from all of these other areas that Mayer and others were concerned about, for him, that was the beauty of it, right? If what you're trying to do is unravel the state, then the best way to start, you get this entering wedge with, uh, a, with a right to religious exemption. Um, and you know, I guess we're going we're gonna to be out of time, so it, that's a great place to wrap up, because I think that that's the, that's the cliff that advocates of exemptions today have to um, reconcile themselves to. Where is the stopping point for this? Um, and do they really want to be aligning themselves with Roger Baldwin and the IWW?